The clash between the political creeds of East and West overshadowed the nations in 1948. It was the setting into which fitted the joys and sorrows of ordinary people. It was a year of great decision, of decisions made in the final reckoning by people like ourselves, by all of us. For on the great issues which unite us, the voice which speaks is that of Britain. Early in the year, that voice expressed its principles in a small way across the football fields. The gallant fight of Colchester against the Goliaths of the First League captured the imagination of a people who always cheer the underdog. When Ceylon was granted independence, few Britons took much note of it. 500 million souls in India, Burma and Ceylon were granted the rights of freedom. The greatest gesture in world history passed almost unnoticed. As freedom was gained in Asia, it was lost in Europe. Czechoslovakia, for almost 30 years regarded as the bastion of democracy, fell to the sapping of its communist fifth column. Even the politically unwary noted that communism made its gains in those lands where the Red Army stands upon the borders. Further afield, in countries bordering the democratic states, Moscow's fifth columns failed in their objectives. Italy chose freedom. In a bitterly contested election, the people returned the government of Christian Democrats headed by Premier de Gasparri. Even in Yugoslavia, communism received a setback. For Marshal Tito developed a streak of independence. He decided to run his country from Belgrade, its capital, without supervision from Moscow. The plans of the 14 men of the Kremlin were going awry. The death of Zhdanov, second in command to Stalin, came as a further complication. But his last orders to sabotage the European recovery program held the world in an uneasy truce. As a relief from this dark picture, Britons turned to 11 men from Australia. Don Bradman and his colleagues from Down Under treated us to a dazzling show of the Commonwealth's classic game. They hit us with everything but the umpires, and we enjoyed it, despite the disappointment of watching our own star batsmen wear out their shoes between the pavilion and the wicket. Another gentleman hit us about quite a bit too. After stumping us at three and six for 20, he went ahead to demonstrate his mastery of a new stroke, the export drive. Car output rocketed. Few for ourselves, but we shipped them in their hundreds of thousands overseas. Steel made new records. Output per man exceeded by 10% the greatest efforts of pre-war days. In shipping, we built three of every five vessels launched upon the oceans of the world. Even this effort gave no guarantee of improved living, for our recovery is largely tied to Europe's fortunes. When from the United States, the first shipments of martial aid began to flow, and the European recovery program became an active plan, hope soared. For the moment, it looked as if there was a better future for newcomers into this troubled world. Maybe that was why they began to arrive in fours. The good family of Westerly jumped from one to five overnight, and the village made the most of it. But if life held more hope for the children of Westerly, it held less for the children of Berlin. Russia cut off that city's food supplies from the western zone of Germany. The threat to starve two million people was Russia's reply to the signing of the Marshall Plan. To stay with the two million or to quit Berlin. To France, Britain and the United States, the challenge was clear. We stayed. Through the great combined airlift, we fed the western sectors of the city. 
that was the decision of the year. With the success of the airlift, tension increased. Yet the gravity of the situation did not prevent Britain from playing host successfully to 57 nations in the Olympic Games. Although we carried off few medals, there was pride in every British heart in the achievement of Maureen Gardner, young Oxford ballet mistress, who broke the world hurdles record. It warmed our hearts too when she added a gold ring to the silver medal by marrying the man who coached her to success. The next meeting of over 50 nations was at UNO's fourth congress. A cuckoo sat in the nest of peace. Russia stalemated the major issue by her 28th use of the veto. To show assembled delegates her power to disrupt life in the tolerant democracies, she called out her fifth column. France was paralyzed by a nationwide coal strike. As the background to a World Congress seeking peace, near civil war developed at the pit end. Across the Atlantic, at least decision was reached in the matter of the presidency. Facing a choice between the cool efficiency of Dewey and the warm-hearted character of Truman, the electors chose the man of human qualities. As America settled her White House problem, Britain turned to Church House to untangle a domestic one. A Minister of the Crown resigned after an inquiry led by the Attorney General, Sir Hartley Shawcross. From the tangled web emerged a new personality of big business, Mr. Sidney Stanley. With relief as the year closed, the public turned from the involved affairs at Church House to the Royal House of Windsor, to a group of human people who symbolize the homely virtues which are the strengths of British life. This new prince, whose name and generation is linked with the destiny of a great race, came as a reminder of the new hopes based on the old face with which this nation bravely faces 1949.